we really are in a predicament, a predicament of wanting to preserve our best interests but having no way of knowing what they are. We have no code. The code of science doesn't tell us anything about these things. As far as evolution is concerned, nothing you do is, is of any consequence. Your genes are already determined even before your birth. So you aren't going to influence the future evolution. So you might as well just uh, drink yourself to death or do whatever you please. So this question comes up of what is the long-term interest that would fortify a definite, uh, if you like, reformation uh, away from this uh, materialist society. Suppose I uh, uh, had a box, and I have a box for the occasion, and I start saying, well, let's put everything in that box. All kinds. I haven't got enough things to put in the box, so I'm going to have to borrow. So give me your pencil, and, and how about uh, your glasses, and uh, how about your pocketbook? Well, I, I put that in, but I want uh, something that, uh, give me your pocketbook. Oh, I'll take my That's sort of big. Your key. Yeah, your watch. Now, uh, I could say uh, this is a stick up. I'm a con man. I'm going to make all for this. <laughs> but what have I not got in the box? What's not in the box? Assume that everything is placed there. What isn't there? Well, okay, the box. The box isn't in the box, but the box is a symbol for it. What's left out? Uh, you're wanting I've taken your glasses away, now how are you going to read? I've taken your key away, how are you going to get home? I've taken your watch, how are you going to tell the time? Are we going to say that the universe is only made out of these things in the box? What about the wants that uh, you're going to have if you don't have the thing? Aren't they part of the universe too? Do I have to convince you that such a world might exist? Uh, if I did, I, I, I could take you into science and talk about forces. Because when the scientist takes the atom apart, what he really gets are not more particles, although that's what he says he gets. But the real thing there is forces. And these forces are enormous. The electromagnetic force is 10 to the 40th times gravitation. And that means 10 followed by, 1 followed by 40 zeros. I used the illustration that if, if a piece of chalk represented the gravitational force, just, to, just that centimeter dis distance, in order to represent the electromagnetic force between particles, I'd have to have, on the same scale, I'd have to have something 10 trillion times bigger than the entire universe. Now, when you realize that that world exists, as it were, beneath the atoms and particles, or behind the atoms and particles, more fundamental than the world and the particles, that world is part of the cosmos. That's part of our cosmology. The problem is, how do you explain it? It's not a thing. 
any more than you can refer to your uh, need for your glasses as as a desire, but it doesn't have the kind of thing that you couldn't put it in the refrigerator. It's not a solid object. It's a dynamic that causes things to happen. A force is still an agent. It's still something you use to do something with. It's it could serve, it doesn't, sometimes it becomes an end in itself. But when the uh, Tibetan neophyte is going through his religious training, he's trying to make the forces his allies, instead of being traps, instead of being ferocious demons. What, what then would he do with him? Then we get, we get then to the point that there has, there has to be a purpose, a purpose which would use these forces. Otherwise, they're self-existent entities without any meaning. And I think we can there, we can sort of come to a, I say, a reconciliation. I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of the rational scientific view that wouldn't accept the existence of God. We can accept the existence of God by recognizing that there's a point to things. There's a purpose. And it's what uh, Tyard of Chardin calls the omega point. The omega point, omega was the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That final point which we are all moving toward or want to move toward in order to go out, to go through the performance of living. And if we once recognize the point, what's the point of existence, the purpose of existence, we then have a different contribution to our cosmology. Uh, uh, I can represent it just as a point. But What's the point of all this? That is that from which all of this flows. It's as though the point were the creative thing as well as being the end point. And when we recognize it can have that dual role, the beginning and the end, we can then see that the universe is a, a something that's brought into existence by the potential of the beginning seeking to gain the fulfillment of the end. And from that, I can, if you like, invent. See, I call it my theory of, pro of process. I can say, well, you can look up process in the dictionary. It says, what? Uh, Process is a series of steps leading to an end, leading to a goal. So you can think of the universe as a series of steps leading to a goal. My purpose is to, is to get an education at the university. Okay, you, you get a degree. Well then, as soon as you get that degree, you're still not satisfied. You have a purpose. Well now, my purpose is to go into business and make money. Okay, then you go into business and make money. Well, then you, after you've got that, you still have a purpose. I remember my father, who at the age of 90, 95, he'd been painting all his life. And when he was a very young kid, he wanted to paint. And he saved up his money and got to Philadelphia and went to the Art Academy. Now, at the age of 95, he's still painting. But he finds that his critical faculty has increased more rapidly than his ability, and he's still not satisfied. <laughs> now, it's that uh, perpetual self-renewal of purpose that makes it elusive to define. But it also gives it its dynamic quality that makes it keep you going. 
and and the fact that it keeps you going or keeps me going is also the reason it keeps the universe going. And that's why I want to show you that it's the thing that keeps evolution going. We can go to a healer. Uh, if somebody's sick, they can go to a healer and get the healing. And then you say, do it all over again for the purpose of science. And you find it doesn't work. If the purpose is different, then you get a different answer. Now, in healing, it's essential that both the healer and the healee have the purpose of getting healed. Uh, I could ramify on with those fascinating stories. Uh, we had a, a radionics operator who used these black boxes and things, and we were trying to do tests on mice. And the first thing, you know, she wanted to show that she could heal the mice. So the first thing was to get the mice sick, so she gave them rat poison. But the mice didn't get sick. And then she had to wrote to the rat poison people for a more powerful poison, and they sent more powerful poison. It still didn't affect the mice. She finally gave up. She had no intent. She had the intention of healing the mice, so she couldn't even harm them. Now, I would say this is very important in science. If you're going to have a science of ESP, you have to recognize this factor. Even though, according to another set of instructions, science can't recognize purpose because it's not one of those things that you can look at under the microscope. So that was my first motivation for purpose. And the association with light came later when I read in Planck's autobiography, Max Planck, he's the one who discovered the quantum theory, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. And he talked about light as though it had purpose. I'm not saying light does have purpose. I'm saying here is a very outstanding science scientist talking about light as though it had purpose, because it always goes to the goal, and it goes by the shortest path. Now, that was a reason for putting light, purpose, everything right at the beginning. Your schematic uh, shows how purpose leads to new entities. Now, these entities presumably interact, possibly creating new purpose. For instance, the purpose of plants would be to feed animals, or the purpose of one type of animal would be to feed another animal. That's, now, why that's do you not show a feedback loop? In your schematic, oh, 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 the feedback. Uh, that leads me to new well, purposes, or is there just, are the purposes given initially? Uh, there are really two questions there, and I want to point out about the purpose that I'm referring to is an ever-outreaching purpose. It's not fulfilling the local situation. For instance, you could say, what is man's purpose? Uh, to survive. But then you could ask, well, why should he survive? I mean, the purpose can always be pushed further on. So, so the question of the purpose of plants to feed animals is, is too local for the, for the kind of purpose I'm talking about here. This is something that carries on through the whole thing. Now, your other point about a feedback loop, in other words, this is the same as this, therefore it should be represented as a circle coming back to itself. In some respects, it is. If I have a spiral that's going around and around and around, it's always coming back to the same point if I'm talking about uh, east, west, north, and south. But the spiral is also developing in time. It's at a different place along this axis, or, or along this axis, or it's different with each rotation. Now, it's true that from here to here, you get back to the first level, but it's the same difference between a, a seed and a full-grown plant, or a, a proposal and the attainment of a goal. Uh, that is a very... That is the important difference we're talking about, because we've, we've stripped away these, this thingness, these 
guises, these methods to get to the bare purpose up here. And that's a difference of competence. Now, uh, one of the best ways to approach this is to think what we mean by dimension. Um, I'd like to illustrate it by saying it's already implicit in space, the four directions of space. For instance, if that are north and south, I can walk north and south without going east. I can walk east or west without going north and south. Those two parameters, those two dimensions, are independent. And you can represent them. This is geometry. As two axes. In other words, you can go along this way without changing this. And you can go along this way without changing this. Now, you could say, now, this leads me to say that there are only four basic aspects. If I were to say directions, you could say, well, there's, uh, oh, dim suppose I were to say dimensions. Then I'd have to recognize that a dimension involves two directions, because there'd be a plus and a minus. So, well, this is only one dimension. It has two directions. So when I talk about aspects, I'm talking about four coming out of these two dimensions. Now, you remember we had things and if I think of things as plus, well, then it, may, it falls right into place that not having the things is minus. But minus isn't uh, is positive in its own right because it's a, a definite need. Now, this one, remember we had concepts here. So I could put concepts here. And then ask myself, well, what is the negative of concepts? So the negative of concept is curiosity. This is the answer. This is the question. And as I would equate the purpose with the curiosity. It's that dynamic that carries you into getting more. But it's not more physical stuff. It's more conceptual, non-physical. So there's a non-physical axis going up and down. This being physical. Right, now, uh, uh, there are a whole lot of things that this can solve. For instance, the mind-body problem. It's always posed as dichotomy, mind-body, or mind-matter. But here, we would say that the mind-body problem is not a dichotomy. It's a quaternary. There are four things going on. Mind and body interact. Each one has a polarity. Body is the physical thing between needs and things, hunger and food, whereas the non-physical axis, or mind, is between purpose and intellect, intuition and intellect. I remember one of the students prepared a huge list Oh, about 40 different words that went into each of these categories, which I'd been guilty of saying uh, during the course. How could it be? Well, I thought she was being very supportive in showing all the words that went into each category, but she had intended it as a critique in that there were too many words in each category. 
Well, the trouble is you're going to divide everything into four categories. They're going to have to be very inclusive categories. The difficulty with this diagram is that people think of it as sort of, that's it. These are only indicating things. I'm having to talk to you in terms of concepts. It doesn't mean that only concepts are in the universe. Now, this, in other words, this is a concept. It's a map. But it's referring to things that are quite other than itself. Suppose I, I say, uh, what's that? Triangle. Okay, triangle. What's this? Space. Space. Or person? Well, either way. But that's a person, eh? You sure? This is a triangle. You mean that's a person? It's only a drawing. The picture's a person. Picture of a person. Yeah. Is this a picture of a triangle? Yeah. No. What would an actual triangle be? <laughs> See, this is a triangle. This represents a person. That's a categorical difference, and it's very subtle. It's really very important for philosophy, and it's been overlooked. Philosophers get mixed up. Sometimes they're talking about, most of the time they're talking about concepts. And then they will explain that there is denotation, but then they go ahead and say that all words denote something. But some words are concepts, pure, pure and simple. Now I'm going to try another step. What's that? Forgive my artistry. It doesn't... <laughs> the smiling face picture of a smiling face. So you could say there's one step uh, away. This, this, this is the triangle. This represents the person, and this represents the person who I assume to be happy because he has a smiling face. So I've made two jumps. Now what if I... Right, she, I, I'm sorry. Well, he, if I'm going to have to say he and she every time. I can't tell. Right, well, uh, incidentally, this whole thing is going to be about monads, and monads are sexless. I hereby announce. <laughs> now, I'll make one more, and it's exactly like this one. And I say, that man is just pretending to be happy. Now, you see, we can deduce that this man was happy, and we could deduce that this man is happy, but he's only pretending to be happy. You see, we've got here the four categories in a rather simple way. This is the concept category. This is the physical category person to which it's referring, we have to assume emotions. I mean, we don't perceive them directly. We, we uh, assume that persons are happy because they're smiling. But we never can tell about spies because they might be pretending to be something else. And that's the complete uncertainty that I indicated at level one was three degrees of freedom. There's no certainty there. Now, the boundary of this sphere is way, 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 way out, but nevertheless, it's a sphere. We're somewhere in it. It's a very peculiar kind of sphere because no matter where you are in it, it's the same size from your point of view. It, it isn't, you're not near 
one edge than the other. Um, you look sort of puzzled, but I'm assuming you get, I'm not responsible for that. That's what the scientist says at least. <laughs> but I have an alternative universe, and which is the universe, let's go back to this invisible diagram here. You see, up to this point, it's the black fox. It's this spherical universe. But this spherical universe can, as it were, feed on itself, grow in its interior as well as its exterior, and become this arc going up. And that's what I have here. It's the toroidal universe. And we have the universe getting born. Think of that circle as a universe. Expanding, expanding, expanding. And then, if you could see around the back side, you'd see it was shrinking again, closing in on itself. In a way, this is what's already recognized by science in what's known as the Einstein-Eddington hypersphere but it's only on the condition that the universe which we now have will eventually close back on itself. The concepts involved in the notion of black holes where you have all, all things going back into this hole and disappearing, let's hope coming out the other side as a white hole. But see, we have that concept contained here that the the white hole would be when it's generating out, expanding, and the black hole when it's going back in. The real reason for the torus I've yet to reveal, but let me first say about it that it's the configuration that allows a universe to be created, an enormous universe, and then all of that, instead of just disappearing, out into space can somehow tuck itself back in and wrap itself up, as it were, and become unitary instead of di diverse. It's almost the problem that you can think of more in human terms, that you get all this education, all this experience, but until you wrap it up, bring it back home to center, it isn't going to be a real value to you. You see, in the arc is this going downness and then some kind of coming backness. We've got a lot more to talk about that. It's what I call reflexive. Now, the, t the torus involves this same reflexiveness in that it goes out and then comes back. And it actually, in the uh, ideal case, it would be a, a torus with a zero hole or an almost infinitely small hole. And that infinitely small hole, if you like, could be the infinite energy of a, or a very, very large energy of a very, very small photon. <laughs> the photon, this unit of light, which goes here, is more energetic as it is smaller. Well, let's take another look at a torus. Here's a nice one. This one is colored. It's what is now involves what is known as the coloring problem. There are seven colors here, and each one touches every other color. It, it, it's part of a problem that's known in mathematics as the mapping problem. And it's characteristic of surfaces that you can distinguish them by the number of colors required to map countries. Now, the surface of the sphere requires only four. And I could indicate it, a four-color map, for instance, could be drawn this way. Now there's one, two, three, four areas in that simplified map. 
and each one is touching every other one, so you'd have to have four colors to distinguish them. I won't take time for it here, but the torus, which is circular in two different ways, do you see why? It's circular this way, but it's also circular this way. Those two different circles give access to itself in two ways. If you thought of four people sitting around a table with the torus, they can also reach under the table. <laughs> you could do sneaky things in this universe uh, made in a toroidal fashion. You could break the law. Well, that's exactly what happens here. The creatures that are evolving get down to this point where there's total determinism, and they're bound in, but they managed to get around the law. That's what an inventor does. But the way you get around the law is to recognize it. Once you can see what the law is, then you can take it into account and make it work for you. And this is perhaps the basic distinction between a universe that's alive and a universe that's just clockwork according to the old classical picture of determinism. What I've shown as a turn here, as a angle, as an angle, is the point at which this descent into matter, into determinism, uh, no longer descends and begins to ascend. In terms of physics, it's when the entropy turns to negative entropy. The word entropy means the wasting away of energy difference. Energy is always there. Remember, energy is conserved by the law of conservation of energy. Uh, but if it's all so equally distributed that there's the same here as there is there, then there's no way to get to use that energy. The reason you can use energy, for instance, say a waterfall, because the water's way up here and it wants to get down there. And in the course of falling, it releases energy. But if all the water was in the same place, you wouldn't get any energy out of the water. It would all be dissipated in the molecular activity of the particles, and you couldn't get down there to use that. So there's something here. This is this kind of magic that occurs here. And the molecule begins to reverse entropy. That is to say, it, it begins to collect energy instead of just wasting it. And when it can do that, it can begin to be a plant. See, the chlorophyll, which is a, essentially a molecule in the plant, collects the energy from the sunlight. And instead of just wasting it away, it stores it, and that storage is what the plant does in growing. It stores order or energy, and that's the first step out of this prison of determinism. So the plan of the particles to move around is reflected over here in the animals, which have the freedom to move around. That is what would distinguish the animal kingdom from the plant or vegetable kingdom is that the animal has freedom of motion. The plant stays in one place, but it has its own kind of freedom. It has the freedom of growth. It multiplies this cellular tissue, cell division, by growing, also by storing order, as I said, against entropy. But growing and storing order are really the same thing. See, the tree has grown to an enormous stature storing all this energy in wood, but it's also an ordering of molecules that made this energy available. So the storing of energy, which is growth, it's also, and this is a very useful word here, organization. The cellular principle, the cellular principle of growth, is dependent on a very correct organizing principle. 
Each cell is like, well, much more complicated than the entire organization of General Motors. Just to digest one starch molecule takes uh, something like a hundred different processes per second going on in hundreds of thousands of places in one cell. And each of you consists of something like trillions of cells. So the, the organization principle here, once accomplished, is then taken over by the animal, and a new principle is introduced. Now I, now I bring in another thing. I said this was a recapitulation, but I'm gradually merging into new, new material, that the animal um, doesn't bother with making its own energy. It draws on the plant for that, in the form of food. Whereas the plant is storing energy, the animal is using energy to obtain goals. Chases that animal, or runs away from this animal, or finds a mate, or finds food. This is mobility. And it's directed at goals. It resembles the freedom here, and there's freedom of position. In much the same way, if I put a mouse on the floor and I came back 10 minutes later, he wouldn't still be there. He would have moved away. The same way the particle. You can't tell where it is. Now, where's the resemblance between this and this? Well, this one, which I, I just sneaked that in, atoms. But I was trying to spare you science. <laughs> but remember, I said the concepts had a freedom of their generalities. The atoms have the freedom in that they store and release energy. An atom, you know, you've seen these spectrum lines. The spectrum lines are kind of music that's issued by the atom at its own characteristic frequency. But you cannot predict when it will do this comes uh, completely either at random, if you want to say at random, or at the volition of the atom. You have no way to tell which. <laughs> For my purposes, it's all right to say it's at random. But when you get over here, the plant is releasing or storing energy. Uh, you can't very well call it at random, because it's very definitely keyed to the cycle of the seasons, to the night and day cycle, to what the requirements of the plant are. The plant is doing it uh, in a controlled way, whereas this, we have to say, is a random, as far as we can tell, is a random way. Well, in a similar fashion, the motion of animals is a controlled motion, where this is a random motion. So you see, I've been able to describe the entities over here in terms of the same parameters as these, with the introduction of the term controlled as against random. This ongoing process, which is what this is, going towards goal, is what I would call cumulative. Each stage, by which I mean these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, each stage involves what's gone before. You couldn't have animals unless you had them vegetables for them to feed on. Or to put it another way, you couldn't have animals unless you had the cellular organization principle which the animal takes over. He's already a full, practically full grown when he issues from the womb. Uh, the problem of growth, is, he just gets to a finite size and stays there where the plant will grow indefinitely if it's permitted. Because it has room, those things go all over the place. <laughs> um, so the animal includes the vegetable principle. The, the plant or vegetable includes what's going on in molecules. Molecules, you couldn't have molecules unless you had atoms, and you couldn't have atoms without these earlier things. What is the freedom of the plant? I represent it in the book as an arrow going to heaven. It's a sort of aspiration. It's the plant reaching for light. In technical terms, it's heliotropism, turning toward the light. 
animal I represent as a circle with an arrow that can be moved around. Choice. Should I chase that rabbit or that rabbit? One of the reasons that uh, some uh, animals like antelopes or buffalo or so on are in herds is because the lion gets very mixed up about which one he's chasing. If there's a whole herd and they're all alike, he, he can't uh, keep his uh, mind on the same one. And this helps them to escape because they're all alike. But the animal has this problem of which mate, which food, which chase, which uh, mate, which uh, decision, should I run or should I fight, which the, the plant doesn't have. Now, what's interesting, I mean, what's uh, characterized this is that it's open, it's, it's free, it can be infinite. This, while finite, is free in an angular fashion, as to go this way or that way. So the combination would be what? See, so here are different goals, but in a limited scope. Here's an infinite goal, but in a single direction. So if you combine the freedoms, you get infinite goals in any direction. And that is what would characterize this creature, infinite goals in any direction. Now, does man live up to that or not? It depends. What we're doing is dividing the whole into seven different kinds of things. That uh, Taurus beside Peggy there, if you want to hold it up, <laughs> with its seven colors. The seven colors here are basic distinctions which would characterize a universe that can fold back on itself. Normally, four distinctions would cover everything. But because you go back, you don't want to get mixed up between these, so you have to have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You, not eight, because you're pivoting on one. Now, that means that there's something very intrinsic about sevenness as a way of dividing the whole, uh, something fu fundamental, so that you can use it in any context. We could say that each of these stages could dis divide into seven. And that's what the grid cons consists of. It's a display of, of the seven broad stages divided into seven substages. On the right, I mean on the left here, I have the names of the kingdoms and keywords that describe them. Light, the nuclear, with substance, force, force of attraction. Atomic, the principal identity. Molecular, combination. Vegetable, growth. And animal, mobility. And this final one that I've uh, named dominion, consciousness, if you like. Now, they are the same as the, they're the same key words as the top. This, these columns are identified by the same key words, potential, binding, identity, combination, growth, mobility, and dominion. So we're dividing each of the kingdoms into seven substages. It with the unicellular animal, the paramecia. Then you get a great number of cells in what are known as sponges or the periphera, they're colonies of cells held together by the attraction of the cells for one another. It's not until the third stage that you get the cylindrates, which are the animals, the first animals to have an organ. Now remember the cylinder, the uh, identity stage for the kingdoms was, was the atom. For animals, identity is to have its own stomach. Here, it doesn't know the difference between inside and outside, but with the 
surrender it's that, that this is me. This is my stomach, and it has only one opening. It's both a mouth and an anus, but it pulls in the ocean and then squirts it out again. Some of them are very beautiful. They look like flowers. They don't move. They're on the ocean floor, very much like flowers. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Then we have animals with a great many organs. This sea was one, one organ. Mollusk, snail, flatworms, roundworms. There are great many categories of animals that have have many organs, but have not yet reached the next stage, which is to organize the organs. Remember, organization was the key word. The, the earthworm is the typical example of an animal that's beginning to organize itself into a series of rings. That's annelids means rings, series of rings. The mouth, the throat, the stomach, intestines, so on. These organs all follow the orders given by the head. Then comes another very interesting variation. The see, the annelids are a chain of segments. Then come the arthropods, which are segments with side chains, legs, arthropods. Maybe that's a clue to arthritis, I don't know. But it, arthritis means joints, and these are jointed legs. I still wish I had a crab to show you, but because it still hasn't got the highest degree of articulation. They're all hinges. There's no ball joint in a crab, but we have ball joints and we can move much more flexibly. But the real secret of the cordata, which is the last thing, is the voluntary nervous system, which uh, comes in on top of the regular nervous system and integrates the whole. I understand I've never actually done it, but you can cut the tail off of a wasp if he happens to be enjoying some very nice honey or something, he won't even notice it, because he can only think of one thing at a time. To show how the grid works, I need to go the other way, vertically. So I could start at the bottom here in the third column with what I call the ego, self-consciousness. That's the human term. For the animal, it's having its own stomach. What would you think it was for the plants? Well, I just wanted you to pause for a minute. Think. What is it that the plant's doing? Of course, it's growing, but it has to produce the next generation. So when it can separate the embryo from the rest of the plant, it has identity in terms of growth. It's distinguishing its own growth from the next generation. All plants after this stage are embryo phyta. This is where it begins. I won't trouble you much with the uh, molecules because this will take us into chemistry, but they're the first chemicals that have their own identity, where the molecules can be separated. The, the methane series. They don't dissolve in water. They keep their identity. And Well, for example, in a crystal, suppose you had a crystal. Here's a, here's a, well, I mean, an atom with a mating atom there, but another mating atom there, and one there, and one there, and one there, and one there. So which one is the molecule? You can say the pair is a molecule, but is it this pair, or this pair, or this one, this one, this one, this one? There, there is no identity to the, mo to the molecule in the crystal. It's this stage the non-functional compounds where you have the identity. Well, and uh, about the atoms, I just have to fill this in. These are the atoms that contribute to things that have identity in the body. Uh, mo uh, most of the things we eat, 
like if we eat protein or we eat starch, it's turned into our own protein or starch, independent of what you eat. But when you take in iron or uh, sodium or some of those special third stage atoms, they keep their function as sodium or iron in the body. So much for the identity. So you see, it's like a crossword puzzle. You can read it this way or this way, and you can fill in unknown things by what you expect. You, you said that the torus you, you, you like is the torus with an infinitely small hole. Mm -hmm. Now, this might be a semantic distinction, but if this hole is infinitely small and you can include only one point in it, then that would be the sort of topological surface on which you, which you can color with only five colors if you don't permit several colors to go through. Well, it isn't infinitely small. Because, as we said earlier, if you were to go to infinite smallness, you would involve infinite energy. It goes, I think, as small as the photon, which is pretty damn small. But remember that the photon is more energetic as it gets smaller. There was a Bulgarian, uh, I believe it was, I saw a paper of his describing a photon that would contain the energy of the entire universe. It was 10 to the minus 80 centimeters. Well, I can't say that such a photon exists any more than scientists can say that there's a black hole that'll eat up the universe. But if there were a black hole that ate up the universe, its ultimate destination would become a 10 to the minus 80th photon. And it might wait there forever or it might explode any time into a new universe. Now, see, I'm trying to tease you into this recognition that man is somehow different from animal. I could uh, refer again to the fact that we've all been through this whole sweep of evolution uh, in order to be able to be human. But there's an example that might bring out the essentially different nature of man which is communication. And uh, communication is not just the bits that go over the telephone wire or the electrical impulses, which is what science would have to recognize, the sounds, the words written. It's what, the, those are only vias, means, to, to express the thought, and it's the thought that's being communicated. So the thought is first level. It might even pay to notice that the thought is behind the concepts. We normally think of thought as conceptual, but uh, concepts are appropriate or not appropriate depending on the meaning. So behind the concept is the value, and behind the value is the thought itself. So let me uh, illustrate with language what these seven stages would be. Um, on the physical level, you have words. Instead of molecules, I can write words. And what are words? They are combinations of letters, just as molecules are combinations of atoms. So here would be words. Letters, W-O-R-D-S. I could take those letters and make a different word, like S-W-O-R-D, sword. Same letters made into a different word. You can do that with atoms, too. You can take the same atoms and get a different combination, make a different molecule. But, and there are an almost infinite number of different words you could have, but there are only 26 letters. Remember, there were 92 atoms. So out of a finite alphabet, you're making an almost infinite number of combinations. Now, the letters themselves, 26 letters, are 
uh, let's say, straight lines and curves in various combinations. I mean, you can take that as B, and if you turn it around, it's Q, and if you turn it the other way, it's D, and if you turn it the other way, it's, uh, which is it? P. You get all different, all those. The point is that you're using something simple uh, to get 26 different letters. And in the Morse code, it's just dots and dashes. In the computer, it's spinery. That's the same kind of thing. So, okay, now I've got to the end of the road. This is spinery. What's here? And that's what you can't specify. And if I say what the thought is, I haven't given you the option that you need here. This is free, open, do whatever you want. And it doesn't have any of this physical nature. It only borrows this physical vestment in order to get over to the other person, to communicate. This is the distinguishing feature of man. We have gone through the, the right. whole arc in this case. And, and so that kind of says, well, if that's the case, then we've reached that. The, the pinnacle. Uh, but don't forget there. now that each one of these stages has seven substages. I didn't go into the animal at much pains, but he didn't immediately start running. He first had to develop bulk and a stomach to digest food. Nothing about motion there, you see. He's stuck to the ocean floor. And then he ended down at the bottom with being a clam or a mussel or a a snail, or maybe he did move a little bit, but that's nothing to what he got at the end. So we have to establish where is man in that sequence. I, so this being one of the substages of that sequence, right, being, being right, the second right. old substage. So the question is, okay, where is this place? Where, where is man today? Let's go back to human... What was it like to be second substage human? You were part of a big colony of other uh, creatures like yourself, other cells analogous to, say, a sponge. There was no organization in the colony. There was no individuation in the person. The person was part of the colony. Uh, the principle of identity, and with it the principle of conscience, guilt, that's something I hadn't brought in. But, uh, see, the mosaic law was the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If uh, the other tribe killed somebody, then the other tribe must suffer. You didn't try to find out which one of the other did it. Another th characteristic of those earlier civilizations of the people were all in communication with each other by telepathy. I mean, they, they acted as a single organism uh, without the power of separateness. And the separateness, I think, began in Greece when they started to make jokes about the gods, no longer taking the authority of the gods, beginning to have their own self-determinism. Remember the tree? Knowledge. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the important thing about that was it was forbidden. It was forbidden to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, now, if God really wanted to prevent it, he just would, being all-powerful, well, he would just not wouldn't happen, but that wasn't, he forbade it. Why, why did he forbid it? To, to give man a choice. Right. Without the choice, so that man acted on his own initiative, there'd be no blame. And if there was no blame, there'd be no learning. It's when you, uh, start tripping over your own shoes, as I said, 
that you pick up shoes. When you can't blame it on someone else, you start fixing things. And it was essential that man have free choice if he's going to learn from his own acts. If he was responsible for what happened, then it becomes a valuable lesson. The consequence redounds to him, and he knows, oh, well, I did that, I won't do it again, or something. I mean, if you put your hand in the fire and you didn't feel any pain, you wouldn't learn to keep your hand out of the fire. You have to receive the reaction to your own acts, otherwise you don't learn. That principle of identity is essential to the learning process. Now, we, we have all these schools of religion and so forth that tell us to transcend the ego, and that's fine provided we've got an ego to transcend. You have to realize that on the left-hand side of the arc, you may not have gotten an ego. Well, uh, that then helps to put man, modern man, in this schemata. He has at least achieved an identity, and he is probably in the fourth, where this interaction with other people involving all kinds of law, not just the laws of physics, but the laws uh, that man makes about his own acts. I mean, uh, traffic laws, uh, all kinds of lawyers are getting to be the most successful business there is because there's so many laws. And one thing about it is as soon as you have one law, you have to have another law. So it gets very complicated. Well, what happens when you've got all these laws? You have something that you can rely on. And if you have something you can rely on, you can use it and move on. I was... Uh, at one point perturbed that standardized nuts and bolts would eliminate all the creativity of people making nuts and bolts. But I soon realized that the creativity could then move on. Instead of bothering your head making a new bolt every time, you just take them out of the bin and they fit, you could concern yourself with what the nuts and bolts were holding together with something more complicated. Uh, it's similar with... Uh, with language. You see, back at the time of, say, Chaucer, they hadn't yet decided what, how to spell words or what they meant, even in the time of Shakespeare. But having a standardized language makes it much more flexible, possible to create more complicated meanings. You don't have to bother about this level. You can move on to this. But if you couldn't tell the difference between swords and words, you wouldn't be able to get to this level. So one of the lessons of this whole thing is to welcome this prison of law and order. Don't feel that it's personally uh, confining us because it's uh, giving us the opportunity. It's saying, here, use me. I won't fight back if you use me right. <laughs> and it's the basis of invention because... Only by knowing what the law is are you able to put things together and make it work. Now this gives a clue as to what the turn is in human terms. It's the point where you recognize what the law is and are able to use it. The three, four, five triangle is an interaction of powers three, four, and five. The power of three is identity. It's the concept, you remember? And the, this is the actual physical world, the hard world of hard knocks, and this is the organization principle. Now, in terms of the helicopter, I have a bright idea how to make a helicopter concept. I try it out in the world of hard knocks. I try if it works and doesn't work. I go back to the drafting board. I keep on back and forth until I get something that flies, something that works, something that goes of its own accord. And that's what nature does by the trial and error fitness principle of evolution.
Now there's another type of evolution, and that's what I call a two, four, six evolution, the evolution involving attraction Again, the world of trial and error, hard knocks. And what I have to put here is animal instinct. Well, let me just put instinct because I don't need to get so many more words. From attraction... Now, this would be the, the rat going through the maze. See, it has the lure of food, and it keeps trying and trying. It can't go there, so it goes there. It can't go there, it goes there. It can't go there. Finally, finds its way through the maze because it's always being um, urged on by the attraction of the food. It's also uh, learning. In the animal sense, you would teach a, a dog to do tricks by giving him rewards when he does the right thing. Uh, to some extent, it's uh, how you teach children and how you learn yourself. But it lays a basis for a pattern of behavior, and the pattern of behavior is quite different from the blueprint of the DNA because behavior is something that occurs in time and is dealing with motion. You wouldn't have behavior if you didn't have motion. Whereas the DNA is a blueprint and is dealing with structure. The last one is the kind of evolution that I think, goes to man. And it's one of the things that makes man distinct from animals. It goes from light down again into the world of fact and stuff, law, to what you could call here, or what? I think my favorite word is recognition. It's not so much conceptual learning as the aha experience. I get it. You suddenly recognize the truth. And it's light itself. I didn't dwell enough on light. I didn't tell you about how spiritual light is. Did I? No. Could you? See, you, think, you, you put it in that drawer along with the thing that physics deals with as being just physics. But that was the most interesting thing to me almost in the whole thing when I found I had to have something at stage one and I didn't know what it was. And it wasn't for quite a while that I, you know, found out about quantum theory. This is all since I was in college that this has developed, so I had to relearn physics. And in relearning physics, I found that everything hangs on the photon. The photon is this unit of action that cannot be subdivided. Uh, you don't have one and a half actions. It's just like human action or human decision. You can't lean out a window one and a half times. You can't drop the chalk one and a half times. It's one thing or nothing. It's very natural to think of that, of, that way about matter, matter will eventually be broken down into little bits and you can't get any smaller. But when you think of action as ultimately quantized, uh, it's not so easy, but that is just as important. And that's what Planck discovered about light, that it comes in whole units or quanta. And these quanta are very universal in their function. Everything that happens between these particles that we talk about, billiard balls, atoms, what have you, everything that happens between them is in the form of photons or light. It's not just communication of one atom to another or one molecule to another or a starch molecule to creating energy or a plant taking light to create starch. It's the creation of particles themselves. And that's part of the physics. I don't want to burden you with it, but what's called pair creation is when a photon 
creates a particle. So to sum it up, the, 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 the photon has a very primary role. Now, why is it spiritual? It's spiritual because it has none of the properties that uh, matter possesses. It doesn't have mass. It doesn't have charge. It doesn't have position. It doesn't have time. It's outside of time. Clocks stop at the speed of light. It has no position because uh, you couldn't possibly uh, locate it. I think the most interesting thing of all about the photon is that only one person can see it. See, there's light pouring in on me, and you're all seeing me, and you're all seeing the photons. But the photons that one of you sees is not the same as the photons the other one sees. Only one person is seeing each photon. Because when you see a photon, you annihilate it. See, if you see the chalk, you say, one says, I see the chalk. Actually, you're seeing the light that's reflected from the chalk, and the chalk stays there. But if you saw the light, the photons, they wouldn't exist anymore. Because they don't exist anymore, they're complete uncertainty. You couldn't predict them. So here's the unpredictable and an immaterial and it's at num in place number one, and it's also responsible, responsible for the creation of matter and all the interchanges between matter. I've had quite a struggle with physicists on this because they like to say the photon is, is just another particle. Could a person look at their, lot, their life today and using the theory understand what stage they're in? Because I would think understanding the stage, they could discover the law they're hitting their head against and discovering it, they can become free of it to move on. Is that true? Or? Well, uh, it's a very difficult to answer your question. I, I, I've been concocting this formula, but I don't know how to, what the dosage should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would suspect that people who have an, such a degree of Requiringness that they can ask that question would, would, would be past the turn mm -hmm. or would be perhaps right at the turn. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, it's hardly necessary for them. They might as well get their head in the mud and get stuck mm -hmm. because until you get into it and get thoroughly wet, you're not ready to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I sometimes refer to them as whiskers so you have these different things going down to molecules, but you could have atoms that decided not to be molecules, that, that wanted to go back. They're called the noble gases, but they're like uh, nuns and monks who decide not to get married and, and go to church and go right back to heaven without bothering with all this toil and travail. So I would say if the person knows enough to ask that question, he's in the fourth stage and somewhere around the turn. Uh, likely is not uh, not likely before the turn because if he was before the turn he would be so insistent on logic that he wouldn't even entertain this kind of nonsense.